Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining this session, Ask the Expert, which is a GP special with a live webinar with Dr. Sarah Jarvis. And this session is aimed at raising awareness of lower limb conditions and specifically conditions that concentrate on issues from veins, arteries, and the drainage system. Providing general advice from Dr. Sarah Jarvis about when to present, how to present, and expectations along with specialist advice about conditions, symptoms, prognosis, and available treatment. Now, we've had quite lots of questions already from social media that I'll be putting to both Dr. Jarvis and Dr. Atkin, and there's the question and answer boxes there as well for you to place any questions in. Can I just remind you that we're unable to provide any specific patient advice, so general advice will be provided. And I'm absolutely delighted to thank both the speakers for delivering this education in their own time and with no payments as well. This is essential education to support clinicians and patients in these challenging times. So once again, thank you all very much for joining us. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions to you first, Sarah. So somebody said, I've got painful legs constantly. They tender, they change colour, and a GP practice is really busy at the moment. Should she be asking for an appointment or should she just wait? Well, the first thing to point out is that general practice is open. It's been open throughout the pandemic. Now, unfortunately, general practice has been under enormous pressure. There were actually 35 million more appointments last year in general practice than there were in the year before the pandemic. So GPs are working harder than ever. We are always here for you, though. And really importantly, what your GP will want to know is they'll want to know what's going on so that if there's something they can prevent, they'll be able to step in early. And that's really, really important. Tenderness of the legs can be for a variety of causes, but what worries me perhaps more is that idea of your, your legs changing colour. And it does make me wonder, there could be many medical conditions which cause it, but for instance, chronic venous insufficiency develops, that develops when your leg valves are damaged, they're weak, they stop working, blood flows down to the legs, and it can't get back to the heart because those valves in the, in the legs are just not working properly. That leads to pooling of the, the blood in the veins, and the veins can begin to bulge, they can begin to leak, and very often that'll lead to discoloration or maybe other symptoms. Now, now, that's certainly something that needs checking out. If your legs are both tender and painful, I absolutely recommend that you should be speaking to your GP. They're not going to be popping you off. They will take it seriously, especially if your legs are changing colour at the same time. Thanks, Sarah. And I think that's really important about going asking for advice and not be frightened to ask for advice as well. Yeah, now, absolutely. Some... Yeah, prevention is key as well. <clears throat> so somebody else has said that their leg is constantly red. They've had two episodes of cellulitis and been given antibiotics. But unfortunately, redness doesn't seem to be improving. Do you think they've got continuing infection? Well, it's possible, but it's not that likely. Now, cellulitis is a condition that we all need to take seriously. So cellulitis is an infection. It gets in through the skin. It causes redness, swelling. And if it's not treated, then it can spread and it can cause serious health problems. So people who have, for instance, lymphedema can be really, really prone to getting cellulitis because things can't drain away. But there are all sorts of ways that you can get cellulitis. It's usually caused by a bacterial infection and the bacterial infection gets in through the skin. There are lots and lots of different different, different types of bacteria um, which can cause cellulitis. One of them I'm sure we've all heard of recently. That is, of course, group A strep, but there are lots of other bacterial infections. Now, having said that, it doesn't necessarily mean if the skin is still red that it is caused by an ongoing infection. However, if you've got tenderness, if you're unwell in yourself, if things aren't getting better, and certainly if they're getting worse, then it is certainly something that you need to check out. But it can be caused by chronic inflammation rather than infection. So inflammation is swelling. It can be caused by infection, but it can be caused by all sorts of other factors as well. The infection, on the other hand, is a bacterial infection. So, for instance, if you have if you've got a bacterial infection like cellulitis, then it's very often 
painful and the skin will not just be red, it may be hot, it may be very tender to the touch and it can start off as a discoloration, but that area will then often become swollen and the discoloration and swelling will often spread very, very quickly. If your skin tone's lighter, that's that discoloration will usually be red or pink, but in darker skin tones, it can seem like brownie, dark brown. I've got a lot of patients of Afro Caribbean origin, and in their case, it can look grey or pe or purple, for instance. So it affects the skin, but it's also affecting the tissues underneath. And as I say, the real key is the fact that it tends to spread. So the redness, the tenderness will often spread. You'll often feel very unwell in yourself. It's most common on your lower legs, on your feet, but it can spread more. It can, it can happen anywhere indeed. Um, but as I say, it's if you're feeling unwell in yourself with chills, feeling generally ill, feeling feverish, lightheaded, muscle aches, all that sort of thing, feeling generally sweaty or hot and cold all over one minute and then freezing cold the next, that's a sign that there is a spreading infection that should always be treated seriously. But if you've just got redness and it's better than it was you haven't got the same tenderness, you haven't got the same swelling, and you're not feeling unwell in yourself, the chances are it's probably inflammation rather than rather than infection. It's also worth pointing out, of course, that actually venous insufficiency, I know I've mentioned it before, but I'll probably be mentioning it quite a lot this evening, that can also cause red legs. Um, and that also needs to be assessed. Sarah, all Leanne, full enough to talk about venous insufficiency, somebody's asked, can you reverse be Venus insufficiency. Leanne, I've spoken quite enough for now, but I'm quite happy to jump in later. Why don't you give this one a go? You start with this one. So uh, Venus insufficiency in itself can't be reversed, but it certainly can be controlled. So remember, as Dr. Sarah Jarvis has mentioned, it's a failure of the veins and bringing the blood back from the toes back up to the heart. And actually, we can do very minimally invasive interventions within a vascular service to actually control and reduce the amount of hypertension. Believe it or not, you don't need half the veins in your lower legs. We can very easily ablate, um, uh, that means simply removing the blood within the superficial venous system. The blood still returns by the deep venous system with no problems at all. So we can't reverse it, but we certainly we've got minimally invasive interventions that can help it. And don't forget, Whilst you're waiting for all of these in terms of being seen by vascular and your intervention, the use of compression hosiery can help to support your veins, helping to push that blood and squeeze that blood back up. And that starts to reduce that inflammation uh, that Dr. Jarvis has talked about. So it certainly can be um, intervened on and controlled. Leanne, I obviously goes without saying, I agree with absolutely everything you say, but I am a GP, so you wouldn't expect me not to talk about general lifestyle changes. You can't reverse it again, as you so rightly say, you can't cure chronic venous insufficiency, but you may be able to reduce it. You can certainly reduce your risk of it, and you may well be able to reduce the risk of it getting worse. So smoking goes without saying there are there, there is a list as long as my arm and the arm of everybody on this webinar of reasons why it's never too late to stop smoking but avoiding you know restrictive clothing avoiding tight girdles tight belts not sitting or standing still for too long moving around as often as you possibly can having a heart healthy diet and there are especially i think in this case we're talking about getting your blood pressure checked getting your blood pressure controlled if you've got high blood pressure keeping your sodium intake down exercising regularly and of course keeping your weight within idea within healthy levels if you possibly can and i am very well aware nobody can be a gp for 32 years without knowing that that is easier said than done but it really really does make a difference if that you can you can reduce that if you've already got it i think I would suggest that in addition to all the things that you've pointed out, um, elevating your legs, elevating your legs above the level of your heart, which will allow the blood to flow back. Because let's not forget that the blood flows out of your heart at very high pressure through your arteries. The issue arises when it's trying to get back to the heart and the pressure inside your veins is much lower than it is inside your arteries. But in addition, of course, it's also if you're standing or sitting with your legs down, trying to get 
back against gravity and that makes it a great deal harder. So keeping your legs up, but moving your legs will really get those muscle pumps in your thighs, in your calves rather working, and that'll help to get the blood back. And then likewise, checking your skin every time you shower and particularly talking to your doctor if you get any new ulcers, because that is just so important. If you have venous leg ulcers, it is not enough just to say, oh, I'll, you know, I'll have a compression stocking. And I appreciate they do a fantastic job, but we can't stop at that. You do need to get it assessed properly. Uh, thank you. And that links on quite nicely, really. So what Rose is asking. So she's saying, should you exercise when you've got inflammation in your legs? Or should you be resting? Well, the answer depends um, what sort of inflammation it is and how recent it is. So, for instance, if we're talking about, say, you know, a sprain, I would always talk about something called price, um, where, you know, you rest, ice, compression, elevation and P is for protect your legs from further harm. Having said that, that's when you've got an acute injury. If you've got inflammation, then exercise is always going to help there are very few areas where exercise is not going to make a difference if you've got a condition such as say peripheral arterial disease where you get what's called intermittent claudication which means pain which comes on after you've walked a certain distance but that distance it comes on more quickly if you're walking uphill or walking into a wind for instance a lot of my patients will say well i, I could do myself much more harm than good by exercising so i mustn't actually the opposite is true. And the same applies if you've got leg problems, for instance, from osteoarthritis. So many of my patients are really worried about exercising because they're worried about making things worse. But actually, exercise increases your mobility. It strengthens your muscles, which protect your joints, for instance. It improves circulation, so it gets the blood flowing back more effectively. It helps the development of small blood vessels, which can help take blood back to the heart. So overall, the answer is yes, yes, and yes, but there are a few caveats. There's a few more questions coming in on the back of the answers that you've both been giving. So somebody's just asked, who's that, somebody that does actually work in a clinic, as they see a lot of patients who are suffering from lymphedema and lipedema daily. But they said the GPs don't knowledge base seems to be a little bit limited in this. Do you think that the GPs, uh, sorry, can get more training in this or should they just be going to the GP or going straight to a hospital? It's a really difficult one. So lipedema and lymphedema are not that uncommon. So edema basically is the medical term for any kind of swelling. Lymphedema is swelling, which is often in your legs or your arms, and that's caused by abnormal drainage in your lymphatic system. Now, to begin with, when you first get it, you might find that the swelling settles a little bit overnight. But actually, as time goes on, it gets more constant, and it, especially if it's not treated. Now, primary lymphedema, often runs in families, much, much more likely if other people in your family have got it. It's caused by faulty genes and there isn't an obvious trigger. Secondary lymphedema is much more common and that's what's caused by a blockage to your lymph channels. And the reason that I mentioned, for instance, people are more prone to cellulitis is that, for instance, if you've had breast surgery and they've had to take away some of the lymph nodes, then you may be much, much more prone to lymphedema um, because they're, they're not the lymph drainage is not as effective. It can't be cured, but wearing compression garments can make a real, real difference. But it's really important because if you've got lymphedema, you are more prone to infection, then you really do need, for instance, if you've got lymphedema of your legs or your feet, then you need to visit a podiatrist regularly. If it's affecting one arm, then you need to avoid, you know, tight, tight jewelry on one, one type. You need to wear, wear um, shoes that don't fit, that, that don't cause problems, that don't rub if you've got lymphedema. You need to avoid really, really hot baths. You need to use an electric razor so you don't cut your legs because you're more prone and so on. So there are all sorts of things that you yourself can do. Lipedema is different. We tend to think of fat cells. Lipedema is basically an abnormal buildup of fat cells, and it almost only affects women. And what 
I often see women talking about is I am out of proportion. Everybody in my family is out of proportion. They've got slim tops, but they've got really big lower lower legs. And it's most most common to affect the whole of both legs. It will virtually never affect one size. It will usually affect both legs. Sometimes it'll affect your arms, but it never affects your feet and it never affects your hands, which is one of the, the classic ways. And I, I really do wish there was more awareness among GPs about the fact that that's the sort of classic way um, to look it up, uh, to, to, to work it out. It's often related to hormones. You'll often find that pregnancy, puberty, menopause, you'll often get women who come in, or I often get women who come in and they'll say, you know, it's just got much worse. It's come on since then. So if I talk about lipidemia, they'll go, but isn't that something you have your whole life? No, your hormones often make a really big difference to it. And actually it's not just a question of appearance because it, they, it can really ache. Your legs often really, really ache. Now, I've said that it's abnormal fat cells and you're out of proportion. Having said that, if you are overweight, it really can make it difference. Unfortunately, losing weight doesn't make much difference to lipedema and water tablets, keeping your legs raised, that sort of thing. They can help for other forms of edema, but they don't tend to happen. Uh, they don't tend to work very much, uh, very well in lipedema. So again, compression stockings don't affect the fat tissue, but they can reduce the, swe the swelling, they can reduce the discomfort. And I do think it's really, really important um, that, we, uh, that we look at what you can do um, because we need to recognize that this, this can cause really major problems for people's quality of life. I, I think it is sad, you know, when we're, we're not experts in everything. Um, Interestingly, um, NICE has just published guidance last year and they recommended that, that um, liposuction can cause some issues. So it's, it's only recommended um, if other ways of treating it haven't worked. So it can reduce the size of your limbs um, in lymphedema. It can improve quality of life. And interestingly, it may reduce uh, the risk of cellulitis. So I think even if you've had it for a while, it is definitely worth speaking to your GP if you're having problems um, because they may be able to, to recommend it. And just to come back on that, the management of lymphedema and lipoderma is really complex. It's a hard thing yeah. to be able to diagnose and to manage. And it's hard for us as vascular specialists and lymphedema specialists. So, you know, your GP is a fantastic port of call, but the idea of the GP is they're able to give you good advice and then signpost you to the appropriate specialists where needed. They're not supposed to be specialists in everything. Even me as a vascular nurse consultant, I find lymphedema management really challenging. It's multifaceted and requires good diagnostic skills to be able to get that management right. So please, please contact your GPs, get that baseline information, we can't reiterate enough today the three main important things of keeping healthy legs is don't smoke keep exercising and keep a normal weight they're the three things that you can do the most for every disease that we're going to be talking about tonight yeah thank you both and that's got a question coming through saying well my legs feel tired and aching all the time so i'm presuming i should go to the gps with this leanne i'll I'll, I'll take this one just to begin with. But again, you know, there are lots and lots of causes. And I think, you know, you will be the person who is seeing them when they have been referred. So feeling tired, it's not not at all uncommon. Firstly, you know, overuse, but underuse, actually not using them enough can make your legs feel really tired. Muscle cramps can cause real tiredness. Um, so a lot of my patients will have night cramps in particular. And there are there are lots of lots of things that you can do to help that, for instance, stretching exercises and so on. Low levels of potassium can sometimes cause aching, but actually tired legs, probably the two things I see, I don't know about you, Leanne, but the two causes I probably see most common as causing tired legs are one, poor circulation. So again, going back to chronic venous insufficiency, um, but also varicose veins, they can cause real, real issues. I mean, it may be a normal part of aging, but it can be due to either problems with your arteries or to problems with your veins. And, and another one, that, Sarah, that I hear commonly, which I'd really be interested in your opinion on, 
is a lot of my patients think it's the statins that's causing their aching of their legs. And their yes. first thing to do, even if they've got a diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease and having that pain when they're walking, as you said, intermittent claudication, they read the packet on the side of the statins and stop the statins because one of the side effects that's reported is achy legs. What's, what's your take on that? So I think we need to remember that we give statins for a reason. And there has been one of the reasons that there's been so much interest and so much publicity about statins is that, let's be honest, the newspapers know everybody's interested because they are the second no, they are the most commonly prescribed drug in the UK. The second most commonly prescribed is anti-indigestion medicine, which probably tells you everything you need to know. The first, the most common drug is the one to reduce our cholesterol, um, mostly because of, because of lifestyle. And the second most common is the one to reduce indigestion. So there's a, a, a concept we all know about the, the placebo effect. And the placebo effect is where you think you're going to get better and therefore you are. And that's why when drugs are studied, they always have what's called a double blind. That means neither the doctor nor the patient knows which drug they're taking. Now, to put this into perspective, the flip side of that, it's what's called the nocebo effect. And that is the side effects that you get if you think you might be taking a tablet and you think it might cause side effects. And in some studies, more than one in four people have had to stop the placebo drug, which is basically a sugar tablet, which doesn't contain anything because they've had such bad side effects from it. There have been huge amounts of pros and cons, ups and downs looking at statins, but we now have studies on hundreds of thousands of people. But one of the most, the most um, impressive studies from my perspective was a study where they took the same very large group of people. Firstly, they gave people um, the drug, or the placebo. And the number of people having severe muscle aches was virtually identical in both groups. Then they went into an open label extension where people knew if they were taking the statin. And suddenly the number of people who got the muscle aches went through the roof among the people who were taking the statins. And I think that really tells you everything you need to know. If they didn't know whether they were taking the statin or not, but they thought they might be, the number of people getting side effects was very similar. Now, that does not undermine the fact that a tiny proportion of people will get a very rare side effect called rhabdomyolysis, which is a very severe muscle wasting condition, but it is extremely rare, particularly at standard doses of statins and particularly with people who are otherwise healthy. But you're absolutely right. I have lost count of the number of patients I've had who've stopped taking their statins as a result. The other thing to bear in mind, of course, is we state, take statins as a preventive medication, which means success is measured by nothing happening. So, of course, people take it, and they go, well, how do I know I'm getting any benefit? Well, you won't until you stop taking it and you have a stroke or a heart attack. But actually, we have now got so much evidence in favor of statins and the vast, vast majority of statins, um, pretty much all statins actually are now off patent. And therefore, there is no question. No GP is giving them because they're being paid to give it or because they're making any profit. These drugs are... I would say as cheap as chips, but they're probably cheaper than chips, given that the, the recent inflation in, in food prices recently, they are incredibly um, low cost. No pharmaceutical company is making huge amounts of money from them. And yet doctors are still convinced by the evidence. Do I take them? No. Have I been assessed to see if I need to take them? Yes, absolutely. Would I take them if I needed to? Yes. And if you need any more, any more convincing on that, does my husband take them? Yes. And no, I don't want to kill him. Thank you both. Now, this question has come up quite a few times. So the people are saying that they've got varicose veins, the parents have had them too, but ended up with a leg ulcer. Should they be concerned? Should I report these to my GP? And when should they be a concern? So I'm sorry, it's a few different questions all rolled into one. But basically, no, it's a great one. America's veins, will I get a leg ulcer? Well, um, Leanne, I'll start off briefly, but you are far more expert on this than me. So the first thing to point out, if you've got bleeding varicose veins, then you need to get them seen immediately. You, you know, you need to send them to the vascular surgeon straight away. But what really the, the problem we've got is that we don't 
always know which varicose veins are going to cause complications. So NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, recommends that you should be referred to a vascular service for consideration of treatment if you've got recurrent vascular va varicose veins and you're getting symptoms. So we're talking there about, funnily enough, aching legs, pain, discomfort, swelling, heaviness, itching. Certainly if you've got any lower limb skin changes and that's really important so varicose eczema is you know sort of um dry discolored brownish if you've got pale skin possibly more sort of purplish if you've got darker colored skin but there again we're going to chronic venous insufficiency if you've got any changes in color if you've got dry skin do not wait until you get to the stage of having a leg ulcer speak to your gp if you've got superficial venous thrombosis, so if you've got hard red veins on the surface, um, then speak to your GP, get yourself assessed, because if they think that your varicose veins might be a cause of it, they should certainly be <coughs> referring you. And certainly, I mean, I would hope that people don't wait until they get to the stage of having leg ulcers, because leg ulcers are an indication that things have gone horribly wrong. Leanne, what about you? I would just say... Um, don't worry if your dad had varicose veins and a leg ulcer. Only a tiny proportion of patients with varicose veins end up at that evidence of severe disease of having an ulcer. The majority of patients out there have asymptomatic varicose veins. In other words, unsightly veins, but not causing any of the symptoms that Sarah has been saying. If you have visible chunky veins, there can be massive veins on your legs, and they're not giving you tired, achy, swollen, throbby legs. There is yeah. nothing that needs to be done about them. The chance except, of that resulting in levels that is more. Wait and exactly that really will make a big difference. But you're absolutely right. In terms of referral, you're not going to get a referral on the NHS at the moment. But really, regular physical activity, keeping your legs up as much as you can, losing weight if you're overweight, all of those things will make a difference. But you're absolutely right, Leanne. For those patients, you're not going to get a referral because I wouldn't be allowed to. If I referred you in and you didn't have any symptoms, they bounced the referral back to me. They wouldn't let me. Well, it's all to do with really vis risk versus benefit of the intervention. Every intervention that we do as vascular surgeons has a percentage of complication. And all that we're trying to do is to be a benefit. If you've just got unsightly veins, there is no true benefit to your health. If you've got tired and achy legs, then an inflammation, our intervention is worth it for the benefit to you. There has been some questions. Venous intervention is available on the NHS majority of venous vascular centers use a minimally invasive um, procedure to be able to do this. It is detailed within NICE guidance. We're aware of um, specific rationalizations which has been made, made at an intermediate level within the NHS, but please, please speak to your healthcare professional about this. They will know the nuances of their local arrangements, but there's no need to pay private. These interventions are available on the NHS. As Sarah says, it's quite clear in the NICE guidance of when this should be offered to you. And the other point to make, I think, is in compression stockings. As a GP, I'm always very, very wary um, because, of course, if, if I've got a patient whose arteries, the, the big blood vessels that pump blood out from the heart, particularly, for instance, peripheral arterial disease, if they're not working properly, then compression could make things worse. So we always would measure the blood pressure at the ankle. So it's called the ABPI, the ankle brachial plexus index. And that's the best way to pick it up. Um, but it is really important that we do check that out before you get compression stockings. I think actually this question follows on from what you've both been saying, that the person that's asked said they've been offered vein surgery for varicose veins, but they're worried because they're old. And apart from surgery, what else can I do if my legs are feeling tired and aching? Well, well, I would say don't be scared because you're old, actually. I mean, I think, you know, there are things that you can do. Um, but really, the modern treatment that we've got is really very, very low risk, even for older patients. As I've already mentioned, I've just mentioned compression hosiery. It is, you know, it, it that that 
will control your symptoms that can help control your symptoms along with getting out and about. I mean, I don't like the term old. I like the term mature. So even if you are mature, there is absolutely no reason why you shouldn't get more active, gradually get more active, keep your legs up when you're lying, you know, when, when you're sitting down, ideally above the level of your heart, but move regularly. Don't spend too long with your legs down sitting very very important don't spend too long standing but actually in my experience more mature patients the bigger issue is not that they're spending too much time standing it's that they're spending too much time sitting with their legs down but please do remember as i say don't be scared do talk to your gp you can get a referral and then you can talk to them about the options that are available for surgery because as i say the majority of the options that are available we we, gosh i still remember the days i am old enough to remember the days i'm sure leanne isn't but i remember the days when the standard treatment was basically to rip the veins out under anesthetic and it was just it was oh it was barbaric it's really very virtually never offered these days and, and I am old enough just to, to remember <laughs> that. If offered me no varicose vein surgery, I would not say I'd be running out the door. If anybody offered me the newer types of procedure in terms of the minimally invasive, it's a walking, walkout procedure. We've had yeah. people go back to work the same afternoon. Age doesn't truly make a difference. I would say it's really about the severity of your symptoms and the benefits to you. And that's what needs to be balanced in your risk not specifically how mature you are. And I think that's a really good point, that don't be scared of going because you may feel more mature. That doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Everybody should go and get advice. So it's a slightly different question here. So this person said they've got a wound on the leg following a bang from the car door. They've been seeing the practice nurse, but the wound doesn't seem to be improving. Should they make an appointment to see the GP? I I would say yes, absolutely, because if things aren't, in fact, I would speak to the nurse about it. But frankly, if I were, if my practice nurse, practice nurse I work with had a patient where things really were not healing, then I would be thinking seriously about the the supply of both of the veins. But actually, importantly, I'd be worried, I'd be thinking about whether or not their arteries um, were not, you know, they weren't getting enough blood supply in there. But either way, the answer is yes, you absolutely would. It may well be that the GP will then refer you to perhaps a district nurse or to a community nurse service who can then do the specialist sort of intervention, such as Leanne and her team would do to check what the pressures are like inside the leg, to check what the circulation, what the, the blood um, the blood vessels, both the arteries and the veins are like. Um, and I, I think that, you know, I would want that sort of person to be seen by a specialist service with Leanne and her colleagues. I think the thing to remember is non-healing is not normal. If the wound is not healing, there is something more that we need to do. And the one thing I would say is that within our primary care colleagues practice, there is a wide variation of different specialities. You have GPs, you have advanced nurse practitioners, advanced care practitioners of another nature, practice nurses, podiatrists, musculoskeletal physiotherapists, and they work fantastically as a team of finding their own expert, if you like, in-house. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a doctor within that team. It has to be the right person at the right time. And that's why sometimes we just need to move you through the internal system just so you're getting the right advice. But if it's not healing, don't just put up with one individual's assessment of that. Keep escalating, asking for others. And if you do get hit in brick doors, your GP is a fantastic point of call to really start to think about that wider underlying cause. I'm the only person you haven't mentioned, and I'm sure you would if you'd had time, would have been the tissue viability nurse specialist because they are absolutely fabulous. Couldn't live without them. And well, on that note, actually, Sarah, nothing to do with tissue viability. On a completely different note in that case. Yes, completely different note. Um, Carl Tams asked that he's they're a podiatrist in private practice, but are there any lower limb conditions they can they can refer directly to secondary care? Uh, I think that very much depends on what specialty you're in, is the answer. So we do have and we have some fantastic podiatrists. I I I think our podiatrists do an absolutely extraordinary job, and they are 
experts in I mean you know when I have patients who go well don't they cut toenails oh no they do so much more than that I mean just so much more than that they have a really wide range of specialties many podiatrists are experts they can do um, surgical procedures for legs and so on so the answer is um, if you have a pathway into your local secondary care um, which has been agreed with local podiatrists, certainly NHS podiatrists would normally, there will normally be various pathways, particularly say for people with type two, well, with diabetes, um, who have potential problems with their legs. But there are all sorts of things, you know, if you think that the circulation is compromised, then I would certainly suggest that you should be, if you can't get them in, if you don't have a, a pathway set up with secondary care, that you should have a, a rapid access pathway to primary care. My personal feeling is that as a private podiatrist, I don't know, I don't work with private podiatry, but I, I couldn't, again, I couldn't live without my, my um, NHS podiatry colleagues. And I know that they have a lot of direct pathways into secondary care. Leanne, I don't know if you know more because you are in secondary care. Yeah, I, I think with the private practice, the thing for me though is, is I always see the general practitioner as the full knowledge holder of everything that's going on. And what I wouldn't want to happen is a private podiatrist simply referring in to a secondary vascular unit without that actual conversation with that GP first. There may be local commission services that may already be aware of these issues, may the GP may already be managed. So it's just about thinking of that wider picture. As Dr. Jari said, if you're an NHS podiatrist, it's slightly different because the systems communicate with each other a little bit easier in places. But the one thing I would say as well is that if you have got problems with blockages within the arteries, from a vascular point of view, that needs to be treated in primary care because it's about secondary disease prevention. Actually, the only patients that need to come to us with the vascular department is those with critical limb ischemia or those with non-manageable um, intermittent claudication after a period of management out in primary care. So to me, it's the private practice bit to link it back to, to their healthcare professional, which actually the linchpin of that is their general practitioner. Yeah. Thank you, ladies. We have another question. My grandmother has had a leg ulcer for years, which isn't healing, but she's also in compression therapy. What would you say? Mm, I, I, not healing is not normal. <laughs> That's what I'd say. <laughs> um, we go back to our friends, the tissue viability nurses, um, somebody who can who can check the arterial blood supply, who can do an ABPI, who can see if there's a reason why things aren't healing. It could be dermatology. She sees it could. I mean, I would say probably the vascular the vascular team, if you haven't got a tissue viability nurse, but if you've got a tissue viability nurse, they will have a way into the local vascular team um, because they will be able to measure the arterial supply. Um, because, you know, you, we know that that venous interventions that compression and so on can help with healing. But the problem is that if your arteries are not sending the blood there in the first place adequately, then compression hosiery can make that worse. And if you're not getting enough blood supply to that area, then it's simply not going to heal. So mine would be exactly the same as, as Dr. Jarvis. It's not normal. Escalate, escalate, escalate until it's at the right place. Um, absolutely. There's two things I desperately want to know. What's the circulation? Do we need to optimise that? Have we actually looked at and scanned with an ultrasound those veins in terms of is there any intervention we can do? We know if we intervene on those veins, we will heal a leg also quicker. We just need to make sure that we are looking at those veins with an appropriate technique. And that technique is an ultrasound scan, not a handheld Doppler that's out there, but yeah. an actual ultrasound scan. So that, that patient desperately needs doesn't matter how they get there through tissue viability to vascular through gp to vascular through practice nurse to vascular doesn't matter so long as they get to that right place so escalate um, healing is not normal non-healing is not normal yeah, and also so does having chronic kidney disease affect the leg healing that's another question oh so that's a, that's a really difficult one so basically um you know your body is all about having the right balance in every cell in your body and unfortunately if you've got chronic kidney disease interestingly of course the vast majority of people with chronic kidney disease won't get any symptoms in the early stages so chronic kidney disease is divided into stages one to five and actually the probably most of the patients i've got who've got chronic kidney disease 
have actually got normal age related kidney decline. If, however, you've got other underlying conditions, particularly diabetes, both type one and type two, then that can both cause chronic kidney disease and can cause problems with the small blood vessels in your leg and the nerves in your leg. So that can really have a problem that can really cause problems, but they're not, it's not necessarily one that causes the other. It's the underlying condition that is causing both. So basically, if you've got, as I say, diabetes is the big one, but kidney problems that are circulation problems can cause both chronic kidney disease and cause issues with leg healing. So we know, you know, we, we need to try and un, uh, control the underlying condition that might be affecting it. So if you can get your chronic kidney disease under control, great. And there are lots of new treatments available for that. There's been a huge explosion in treatments. In fact, I, I would say that the interesting is a group of drugs called the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, and they've been described as, you know, the statins of the 21st century. Doctors are putting them on a par with penicillin and aspirin there they've been they've made dramatic improvements in our management of chronic kidney disease in particular and i think that those improvements are just going to continue we really are going to be in a position i think you know within the next few years where we can make dramatic inroads the number of people who've got chronic kidney disease you need to manage the chronic kidney disease but you also need to manage the condition which is causing it in the first place and interestingly sglt2s for instance are licensed they were developed for the treatment of type 2 diabetes but they've now been found to be so effective in managing uh, in managing chronic kidney disease that they're actually licensed some of them are now licensed not just for the treatment of people who've got type 2 diabetes but for people who haven't got diabetes who've got chronic kidney disease so we need to look at the whole patient and the whole the whole picture thank you leanne anything to add no, no, just just remember it's the body that heals these wounds. So there's no magic dressing or magic potion that we'll put on. So we just need to optimize everything we can. In terms of optimizing chronic kidney disease, your GPs and your primary care, including your pharmacists, are fantastic at doing this because many of the medication can exacerbate it. So it's just about getting that that check really of that perfect optimization of that kidney failure. And get your blood pressure controlled. Yes. So this is quite a long one, but I think it's really interesting. So I paid for a health MOT. And one of the things that stood out was when the nurse took blood pressure readings on the leg and they take medication for high blood pressure, the leg readings showed that it was not working as well as it should. What's worrying this person is that the mum's legs started to go purple from about 70. But and this is how her... Yeah, uh, yeah, she smoked yeah. for 50 years. <laughs> Everybody's mum smoked for 50 yeah. years. <laughs> yeah, caps from full strength. Um, she's never smoked, but does have a weight problem. And she's worried that she, her legs will end up purple, but she doesn't have diabetes. Okay, so first point. Diabetes, two very, very different conditions. Type one diabetes is what's called an autoimmune condition. And that's caused by the body's immune system, which normally helps you fight off disease, turning on part of your body and destroying the cells inside your pancreas, which produce insulin. That is a very, very different condition. It's nothing to do with lifestyle. Type two diabetes is almost all, certainly largely to do with lifestyle and the sort of things that affect your, that, that make you prone to type two diabetes are also the sort of things that make you prone to problems with your arteries. So if we think about the things that make you, that, that make you prone to problems with your arteries, smoking, goes without saying, having type two diabetes, but having high blood pressure, having raised cholesterol, all of those things can make a difference. She does say that she's got a weight problem um, and that can increase your risk, but frankly, it's nothing like as big a risk as, uh, as being a smoker or even an ex-smoker. The risks of smoking um, from smoking do decline very rapidly actually and substantially when you stop, it's never too late to stop. But unfortunately, there are some conditions where you will continue to have raised um, raised risks as a result of having smoked in the past. But basically, if your blood pressure in your legs is lower than the blood pressure in the arms, that could suggest that you've got a problem with the circulation the arterial supply and again i go back to this idea the arteries are the the blood vessels that pump what that carry blood at 
high pressure out from your heart to the rest of your body. The veins are the ones that carry blood at lower pressure from your legs and from every other bit of your body back to your heart. Now, having a problem with your arterial supply, if it was in your legs, I can bet your bottom dollar that your mum who had purple legs from about 70 also had something called intermittent claudication. And I've mentioned that already. That's the condition where, where if you walk too far, then you can end up with pain and that pain settles after you stop and the pain comes on at shorter distance if you're walking uphill or if you're going against the wind. And when it gets severe, you get that same pain at rest. And that is where we need to worry. That's where, as, as Leanne said, that's where the, her teeth would need to be involved but it is still important that she goes to see her healthcare professional to get an assessment because the the point is that there we're almost certainly not if she hasn't got any symptoms from it she hasn't got intermittent claudication this is not about referring her up to the vascular specialist straight away this is about thinking about all those life, lifestyle factors, the smoking, the regular exercise, getting your cholesterol under control, that could be by losing weight, it could be by improving your diet, it may be that you'll need a statin on top, it's possible that you might need a, a plate, an anti-platelet medicine, but not necessarily, um, you might do depending on what the pressures are, but that would reduce the risk of complications happening, but I do think that really the reason for you, if you haven't got symptoms for going to see a healthcare professional is that you need to think about the fact that the blood pressure is lower tells me that you're not at high risk because you haven't got symptoms, but you are definitely at increased risk because you have got lower pressure. And that means that we need to start looking at those diet, lifestyle, and possibly medications, um, prime, what we call primary prevention medication. So that would be statins, blood pressure lowering if necessary, and antiplatelets if needed. Thanks, Sarah. Liam? Um, I would just say the MOT has done its job. It's highlighted an issue that you need to take some action with now. Sarah's mentioned some of the issues that the, the healthcare professional needs to do in terms of assessing your risk and medication intervention. But actually, as Dr Jarvis said, a lot of this is what you need to do now. Stop smoking, optimise your weight, exercise more. So in a way, this is a kickstart, if you like, to your new healthy lifestyle. And that's the one thing that's going to prevent you from carrying on on the same path as your mother. It's not really what we do. It's all about what you're going to do. Absolutely. And the only thing I would add to that is that, you know, we have long been aware that scare tactics don't work, that saying to people, you've got to stop smoking, your legs are going to fall off, doesn't work. What you need to think about is what matters to you. And if your priority is about, you know, being able to run around and play football with your grandchildren or being able to go on walks with your walking group when you're retired, whatever it is, you need to think about what your priorities are. And you can bet your bottom dollar that actually all those lifestyle changes we've been talking about and you know make no mistake I do not I, I absolutely understand they are not easy but small changes really do add up and the best way for you to kick start this healthy new lifestyle as Leanna said is for you to work out what your priorities are and to work towards them. And there's loads of help out there for you on the NHS resources that we can signpost you to that helps you make those tiny changes. Thank you. We've had quite a lot of questions all focusing around leg cramps and people saying they get a lot of leg cramps during the day, but some get them at night as well. How can this be stopped? It's a really, really difficult one. And I'm, I'm not remotely surprised that we've had so many questions in about it because it is a very, very common condition. So many of my patients come in and particularly night cramps. So leg cramps are very common. They're particularly common in your calf muscles. They can happen anywhere, but by far the most common. But there are some medicines, for instance, um, which can cause leg cramps. We don't know exactly why people get them. Sometimes it can be due to, you know, for instance, having the, the wrong medication um, that could that, that there are there are certain medications that can make it worse. Um, but it may well be that we are never going to know exactly what it is that causes your leg cramps. So the secondary, what we call the secondary causes, things like 
Statins I will mention, but as I say, in the majority of cases, that's not the case. But water tablets, thiazide diuretics, loop diuretics, which are often given for retained fluid, for instance, in heart disease. There's a, a blood pressure medication, another blood pressure medication. Thiazide is usually given for high blood pressure, but there's another blood pressure medication called nifedipine. Sometimes people who have bipolar, for instance, will take lithium. All of these medications can cause leg cramps. So it is definitely worth speaking to your pharmacist in the first instance and seeing whether they're, whether any of your medications, if they came on, particularly if they came on after you've been taking them, then do think about those. Being, um, being dehydrated can definitely make you more prone to leg cramps. If you have problems with your kidneys, then it can affect the salts in your bloodstream, your sodium, your potassium, having, having abnormal levels of those can cause it. Peripheral arterial disease, can cause it again more common that it's going to cause things like this intermittent claudication that I mentioned. But really, in a lot of people, there isn't an obvious cause. It usually comes from the muscle because of muscle spasm, and that usually occurs when your muscle is contracting too hard, can affect the muscles in your feet. It typically lasts for a few minutes, but it can last a very long time. I get them myself, and it can, you know. You you can sometimes I, I will feel I will know which leg I've had muscle cramps in for 12, sometimes 24 hours after I've had it. So I'm very, very conscious that they can be really, really problematic. Now, apart from there are some medications that, that have been recommended. We don't recommend quinine routinely. We used to recommend quinine on a really regular basis, but we actually don't recommend it that often just because you can have quite a lot of serious side effects, including heart problems from it. So overall, we don't recommend quinine until it's a last resort. There are some other treatments that people talk about, magnesium, vitamin B complex, vitamin E, that sort of thing. But actually, again, there is not that much evidence that they work. Perhaps more importantly is things like keeping hydrated, um, stretching exercises, really worth giving a try. So what we're talking about here is things keeping it leaning towards the wall. So putting your leg, you're standing a little way away from the wall and then keeping your feet flat on the floor and then moving, bending your ankles so that you are stretching those ankles. It is well worth giving them a try. They are not going to do any harm. And we would suggest that you do it sort of, you know, five times, maybe five minutes, three times a day doing the last one about maybe sort of half an hour before bedtime. Once things have settled, and I, I have had quite a lot of patients where things have settled within about maybe a month or so, sometimes as quickly as two weeks or so, and then they can cut down and start doing it every couple of, um, uh, you know, once or twice a day. Um, it won't necessarily absolutely get rid of it, but it, you may find that it improves it. The other thing which may work would be to use a pillow to prop your feet up when you're lying on your back so that you're not those legs, aren't, those muscles aren't shortening, maybe hanging the feet over the edge of the bed if you're sleeping on your front. And certainly I would recommend keeping your blankets loose. Use a duvet rather than blankets. And if you are using blankets, don't tuck them in because that will mean that your toes and feet will point downwards and that can cause those muscles to, to contract. Yeah, anything to add? No, I think Sarah's covered it all. Really, the diagnosis of cramps is a diagnosis by exclusion, if you like. We start off with the common causes. We make sure there's nothing significant there. The arteries, the veins, the kidneys, and then we go down. And if you've, the, the one thing is you need to speak to your general practitioner about this to make sure that there's nothing significant going on. And then we can work with you about controlling it. Often it's quite normal and nothing to be overly worried about, but we just need to make sure there's nothing tremendously going wrong in terms of the, the arteries, the veins or the kidneys in the first place. So just ensure that you are reporting it back to your GP, but don't get overly concerned. If they've excluded all of those things and you still get in the leg cramps, it might just be one of those things, but it's about making sure we've excluded those major causes in the first instance. Thank you, ladies. I think we've got time for just one more quick question. And this is actually from a nurse who's working in the community. And she's been told that wearing compression hosiery or flight socks when at work can help as a preventative measure to develop in leg issues in the future. 
Now, is this true or is she risking weakening the vessels if we're in the hosiery when your legs are currently healthy? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one very quickly. Okay. You're not going to do any damage by wearing compression hosiery. First. Exactly. So long, as, so long as your circulation is good on the way down, if, you, if you're active and you're uh, currently working, you're probably going to be under the age of 60. The chance of getting problems in your arteries is relatively small. So I wouldn't be overly worried about them causing damage. There's a question of what's the benefit? Um, so preventative wearing stockings for primary varicose veins, there is no evidence. There's evidence about recurrence of venous leg ulcers that compression therapy is extremely valuable. But you, we would be encouraging you um, to, if you have got symptomatic varicose veins, go down the assessment route rather than start on the long-term compression route. But if you're just getting tired and achy legs, there is more evidence coming out in terms of a sports side of things, in terms of compression of a... Of a, of, of, can help. I would simply say, if you finding them of a benefit, if your legs aren't as tired and achy towards the end of the day, they're not going to do you any damage. But if you have thinking you've got symptoms of venous insufficiency, I would encourage you to get them checked out in terms of a referral to the vascular service if they are symptomatic, rather than putting yourself on long-term lifelong compression. And just remember to moisturize the skin underneath those stockings to keep that well hydrated too. Thanks, sir. Sarah, anything to add from yourself? No, absolutely. I, I mean, you know, the other thing though to point out is I do appreciate that if you are, if you are, you know, actively working nursing, chances are you are probably running around being physically active, but you're probably also extremely busy. So please, please do prioritise making time for yourself to exercise regularly. Well, thank you very much, ladies. I'm afraid the hour has absolutely flown by. There's been lots of questions. And for me, what's really come out of it is that the GPs are open. They're an excellent first point of contact, have a wide range of knowledge and are able to refer into different areas as well, such as Leanne's vascular service or tissue viability. And it's about working as a team interprofessionally with the podiatrists and the pharmacists as well. And together as one team, the NHS will work well. So and thank you very much. And I would just like to say, as behalf of the Legs Matters Coalition, um, I would like to thank um, Professor Uzi for giving up her time to chair this, but I would like to wholeheartedly thank um, Dr. Sarah Jarvis. You are working in a very difficult situation out in primary care at this moment in time. And, you know, we really appreciate giving up your own time to do this for our campaign. So thank you so much. Pleasure. Thanks very much for having me. Thank, thank you for the great much. work you guys have been doing. Thank you and have a lovely evening, everybody.